Hello, welcome everybody to the first episode of the Van Howe Concerto videotapes. Um, today we're going to do just the first movement and there's going to be a video for each, uh, for each movement, so this is number one. First movement of the concerto, which you all know, I suppose. Um, the one thing I want to mention absolutely is that uh, the facsimile of the manuscript is available on the internet, so you don't need printed editions. Printed editions will steer you in a certain way, and the manuscript lets you find your own solutions to technical and musical problems. And uh, it's also very interesting to look and to read from the same thing that uh, the player or the composer back then, Probably Berger, uh, played it first, and to read from the same image that he used. It's much more inspiring. So, let's see. First of all, uh, in a classical concerto, you're supposed to play the tutti parts as well. So I'm not going to get go into the tutti parts because they're quite straightforward, they're quite simple, they don't present any uh, special uh, challenges. So let's go straight to the solo part. And you all know the solo part, it goes like this. So we all know the theme. The funny thing is that when you look at the other instrument parts, which are all on the internet, the violin parts, the whole orchestra is on the internet, and when you look at the violins and when you listen to the violins, they play. They slur the first two notes, and the bass part has them separate. Uh, the winds, they play kind of a kind of dotted rhythm. So the last note is set apart, and the two notes, the two first notes, really belong together. So a bowing, like you see in some modern editions, like this, I think is out of the question. It's very practical because you have the same bow length, so technically it's easier. But it's not really musically appropriate, I think, for the phrase. When you look at the phrase, and there's a kind of gesture in the music, you see? There's a kind of a gesture in this kind, in this uh, style of music, in Baroque and classical music. You have something like a, a speaking quality to the music. It's not just notes. It's it, it's got a, a cadence. Uh, how how should I say that? It's got a, a movement to it. <laughs> See, and that's easier to do when you slur the two notes like the violins do. <laughs> so. Thought, uh, food for thought, uh, something to think about if you can use this idea. I think it's interesting to do it this way. You will see the theme comes back, of course, later on, uh, and uh, it comes back three times, actually. So we'll see when we get there, but maybe you shouldn't do it the same way every time it comes back. But let's move on first. And then. As you can see, I go over three strings. You can, of course, or even you can stay on one string, you can go over three strings. This is one of the interesting things about Viennese tuning is that you can you always have the choice of going modern bass style up and down on one string, or you choose to go across three or even four strings. And on the Viennese bass you can do that, you can do that in the first position, you can do, even do that in the high thumb position. If you use all four strings, go across the strings, we'll get back to that. So here you have the choice, and as you can see, I like to put the third finger there as a parallel finger. This makes us the slur a little bit easier, smooth. It's smooth, right? Then, as you can 
can see I use the three harmonics, which bleed a little bit into each other. You can do that on purpose, or you can just use the resonance of the instrument. That's the great thing about the Viennese bass. You have all these resonances of, uh, of the open strings and the harmonics. So you can use them. Of course, you could also do, do this, or even, but I like this one because of the other resonance. So. As you can hear, the gut strings produce a kind of impure sound, a kind of sound full of parasites, uh, which to the ear that's used to the modern bass may sound a bit offensive maybe, but it grows on you. I like, I very, like very much the, this sound where you, where you're never really sure if you're going to grab the string completely, how the string is going to behave. It's kind of an aesthetic that I like very much. So if you're not used to it and you hate it, bear with me, you'll get used to it. Again, so many possibilities. <laughs> All kinds of possibilities on one string, on two strings. Uh, where you're going to move from one string to the next. See? Many possibilities. So I would like to encourage you to really find out for yourself uh, how the instrument behaves, how your, how your bow works with the strings, because probably if I have to play it on a different instrument with different strings, I'll probably use a different fingering because I have to listen to what the instrument wants from me. So you have the element of what does the music want? Also, what does the instrument want? What does the ins instrument tell you to do? Sometimes it kind of refuses things and you have to find a different way. So, food for thought. <laughs> It's interesting, you have this repeated bar with, when the repeat comes back, the same slur as you have in the beginning. Uh, so you have this. It's a detail you can as well leave out the slur, but I think it's interesting to, to try. And then you have to up bows. Okay. Then the next bit, uh, you can see uh, a violin clef and an octava sign, octava. Um, in the concerto, there's a lot of places where you have the octava. And uh, for me, they're very often, let's say, in poor taste. Uh, I'm not sure they come from Van Hal himself. I guess they come from a player, from uh, Sperger, probably, maybe from Kempfer. There seem to be two different handwritings in the Ottawa signs. We don't really know who wrote them. And my basic idea is to leave them all out and to see how it sounds, how the concerto sounds without them. And most of the places for my taste at least, sounds so much better if you leave them all out. Uh, like for instance, the beginning of the second movement, if you play it in the normal position rather than in the thumb position, for me it sounds a hundred times better. Now, that being said, this first one here, I have two or three exceptions in the course of the concerto. At the very end, I go an octave higher, and this is one of the places where I actually prefer the octave. So for you to decide what you're going to do with the octave, you have this. I like to play the, the arpeggio first here. You can play it here, of course. And it sounds a little bit, it speaks easier here. Everything thumb position, see? And then we stay in thumb position. 
Now, that's really interesting. Uh, when you see this passage, the first time it's written, slurs, two notes, every two notes slurred. But when you, the same passage comes, comes back later on, you have a different articulation. You have this. The last group is three notes slurred and one separate. And I think that's the correct version. I think the first one actually is a, um, a misprint, miswriting, actually. I think that's what it should be. It sounds more exciting, it's more interesting, it's less boring. Um, I think musically it's worth, worth to, to explore if this, if this works for you. Uh, you have two choices of bowing because Viennese tuning, again, you have options in fingerings, uh, you have options in bowings as well. You can start a bow, which brings the last note down bow, so you can give a little accent on it. You have to explore, you have to see what works for you. See? It's more interesting this way. So see if it works for you. Also see if it works an octave lower. The second time I go an octave lower, you will see. And maybe you saw this. Normally you would do this. Couldn't be easier, right? But it's kind of messy. Which could be part of the aesthetic you want. Some messiness can be nice. Some Something rough, something messy can sometimes be nice. Uh, can bring an extra element to the music. I like to do... To mix them. Sometimes I mix them. And the last one I play here. Or you can mix both, pos both possibilities. Actually, you could do this. And you could do this. So, three possibilities again. So, if you take the easy way. kind of a written fermata in a way. So the rest of the bar is empty until you come to the upbeat to the next bar. So what can we do with this rest? Or can we have a bit more tension there? This is a kind of a tension grabbing moment, kind of a standing still. See? So what could we do? Do we have to do anything? Maybe not. But very often when you have uh, this kind of uh, moment of silence, you can add a trill, for instance. You could use that to make a flourish. Or as one of my student is, students uh, did last week. Uh, it's beautiful too. So you have this kind of freedom. Um, this is maybe a good moment to talk about general musical things. Um, when you look at Baroque and classical music, most of the time, um, half of the job is for the performer. We tend to think that once a composer has written his piece, that's holy writ and you can't touch it and you have to play it as it's written. And back then that was not the case. Uh, the performer had his responsibility uh, usually, I say his because usually there were men, there were not that many uh, women musicians back then. Uh, so it was the responsibility of the performer to fill in things or to change things or to rearrange things the way he felt it. Okay, so you can, f you can grab the freedom to, to do something there. <laughs> And then it says dolce, and here in this passage, which you will see on the screen, in this passage you have again a kind of awkward 
moment bowing wise because normally with the upbeat we would do the upbeat up bow <laughs> But then we come up bow for all these, we start up bow, this series of slurs, you see? And especially this one is up bow, which is kind of weird. Um, so you have to choose your moment of weirdness. Uh, you can think that this is weird as well, but I like this weirdness to, to the up upbeat down uh, sorry and this this one comes down bow and then I continue with the down bow see so you have to work out a bowing that that fits the music again see what works for you. I'm not going to say you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. These are things you, ha you have to find out for yourself. You will find when you play a lot of Viennese music, Viennese classical bass, solo music, that very often the most obvious bowing is not really the best one. Very often when uh, in Sperger pieces, for instance, some bowings are really awkward and clumsy and it's very difficult and you just turn the bowing around, start up, instead of down or start down in a, instead of up and suddenly everything works beautifully. So this is one of those places where you have to find a way so that musically you can make it work. Uh, like we did in this um, and I go down bow again. So it doesn't mean when you end down bow it doesn't mean the next one has to be up bow. You can be down bow twice. And here, I like this. I like this resonance again. Of course, you can do this. Different possibilities, but I like this. Here again, uh, where it says forte, I think that's a misprint or miswrite. I think the articulation should be the other way around, too slurred and then too separate. This doesn't really make sense uh, as it's written. I think it's, uh, it's just uh, an oversight or a, a mistake from the copyist. Doesn't seem to make sense otherwise. Uh, you can try it as it's written. It sounds strange. That's it's a bit strange. He would have written, if he wanted this effect, he probably would have written two sixteenth notes and an eighth note, and not two sixteenth notes slurred. So it doesn't really make sense. So, um. As you see, I go down to the third string again. You can, you can go to the first string, of course. Again, this choice of which string are you going to use, depending on what you think the music wants, how you feel the music, what the instrument wants, what your bow wants, what your technique permits you to do, because when you're not, you're not used to playing across the strings, it may seem awkward in the beginning. So give it a little time. Always be open to all the possibilities. Try to do even the most crazy things. If you think this is not going to work, just try it anyway. You might find some really interesting uh, ideas. Uh, nice inspirations by doing things that are not so, not so obvious for a modern bass player. So I go down and I stay here. Everything in one position. See? You could do it across less strings, two strings, three strings. I go to the fourth string. And here too, the four string. And then it's interesting because yeah, they, they have this huge skip to the high E, which is right there. So you don't have to go. It can be spectacular to do this, but you have to hit it. <laughs> so it, it's easier to do. 
But then, again, you have the choice. What are you going to do with the next couple of notes? Or, or three notes here. See, you can choose one, two, or three. One note here, then two notes. Or, and then take over. Right? And then we go into the next tutti. So this is very interesting when you play the concerto and you have the both roles. You have the role of a tutti player and you have the role of a solo player. And it's it's very it's very exciting to do that. Um, and you switch immediately to the to the, the tutti bass part and to the the role of a of a tutti player of an ensemble player. And this is very exciting. You can you kind of step forward for the solo, you step backward again for the for the orchestra part. And this is you stay connected to the piece. Uh, very often when we see concertos, it's it's I find it very strange sometimes. Uh, the introduction of the orchestra and the soloist is standing there looking at his feet and tightening his bow and taking his handkerchief and uh, wiping his strings. And then, okay, then it's my turn. So it's nice to be involved from the beginning. And when the tutti comes in the middle as well, don't switch off, you're always in the music. So this is one of the, one of the aspects of uh, classical playing that I like very much. Some people maintain that the Viennese bass or the Baroque bass or even the classical bass was always played with the underhand bowing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's about the music. It's not so much about how your hand is on the bow. Sometimes I use a gamba style bowing in Viennese tuning. It works very well. Sometimes I use overhand bowing. By the way, this is a bow by Jérôme Gastaldo. Uh, this one too. I have plenty of his bows. Uh, so I'm using uh, what we call French bow, but for me that's too political. Uh, this is a very short opera bow, actually, an opera pit bow, very short. Not a pit bull, pit bow. Uh, it was made so short in order not to hit the colleague next to you in a very small opera pit. So, let's uh, move on to the next bit. And don't get your knickers in a twist about the bow holes, please. It's nothing political, it's about the music, it's not about what kind of instrument or what kind of material you use. So, the next one. So, the same theme again. This time again with no slurs. The first time I used the slurs mm -hmm. to imitate what the violins do, because it's always good practice, I forgot to mention. When a theme comes for the first time, the second group or the second musician who plays the theme, the theme plays it the same way as the first person did, uh, basically. So if the first if the violins play, mm -hmm. then I'll follow with the same thing. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, a lot of water under, bri under the bridge, a lot of things happened. It's not the same atmosphere as the beginning. It's got, the beginning has got this gesture feeling, which is kind of, I often ask my students to sing or to, to speak a certain phrase away from the instrument. And this helps you to feel the music much better than with the instrument. Sometimes you have to study music away from the instrument and just imagine it or just read it and speak it or make gestures that go with the music. And the gesture is going to help you make the music better. You, you're really going to feel it better physically. Uh, so when it comes back, the feeling is different. It's not the same. Uh, it's something new. It's a different tonality. And I would separate the notes this time, also for a technical reason, because this note consumes a lot more bow than this one. If you want to have the same loudness, your bow goes a lot faster. The higher you get, the faster the bow. So you don't really have time to go... Other it's going to sound too weak if you do that. 
And uh, as I said, it's a different feeling now, it's not the same thing. So let's separate the notes. Okay, so far so good. What are you going to do with the C sharp? That's a bit dangerous, right? So let's make it easy. It's right there. And then we'll go back to thumb position. You could different possibilities. I think the best one is to keep it in one color and on one string. But also, instead of going down bow, and because this, I don't really like this up bow. So I thought, why not? See? So feel free to do crazy things. No musician in his right mind classical musician, modern bass player, I think nobody would do this. But yeah, I like it. It's a tricky passage. You have to find a way, because it goes fast, you have many notes, and going back and forth between two strings is kind of tricky. So I go like this, I'll do it in slow motion. And now, mm. and now the second I play on the second string. Sorry for the beeps. This avoids to do this over three strings because it's fast and it, it won't be really clear. So you can try it over three strings. You can try it on the second string like I do, or you can find your own solution. Sorry. Mm. Again, again, you have this triad which you can play here. Oh, mm. different ways. The one I prefer is this one because this allows you a little bit more time to prepare the first first finger on the D. And the last one, maybe you've seen before, I use quite a lot of extension, which is quite easy to do on a Viennese bass with the frets. The frets allow more extensions because it doesn't really matter all that much where you place the finger. If you do that on a modern bass, you hear different notes, but it's the same note. So this allows more leeway in your fingerings. Uh, so that's one of the advantages of using frets. I like a bass with gut strings and frets. In, in Viennese tuning, uh, when I started, I used a modern bass, a modern four-string bass, and I used steel strings and no frets. But the uh, frets make your playing, uh, bring your playing to a whole different a different world or a different planet or a dif different level uh, musically and technically because the technique and the music are really intricately uh, connected. So if you have a spare bass, maybe try one of the basses with gut strings and frets. Uh, I have my own wall of basses here. They all have frets actually. This one's got silk strings. And this got one. This got. This has got uh, modern strings, modern state of the art strings from Gensler, also in Viennese tuning. And this has got gut strings in Baroque tuning. Uh, but I like playing with frets because they, like I said, in a certain style of music, they allow for a, a deeper understanding of the connection between technique and and musicality. But uh, okay, let's move on. So we have. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. And then uh, a, a very interesting bit. So this is very interesting. In many editions, I'll first show what's in the manuscript. You can see it on the screen. So the 
end node of the first bar and the first node of the second bar are not connected. So you have this series of... Uh, I like both versions. You can do this. You can connect them. You have a whole series of uh, quarter notes. But I like the idea that you have a, an accent on the first note of the second bar. So I don't think it's a, it's a misprint or it's, I don't think it's a mistake. I think this is how it should be. <coughs> Again, <coughs> depending on how I feel, maybe one day I'll play it like this and one day I'll make it a whole series of uh, syncopations, syncopated notes. Uh, the choice is up to you, but again, don't trust an edition, just make up your mind. Maybe today you'll play it like this and maybe tomorrow you play it a different, see a different taste. The only thing that will happen is that maybe you'll have to start up, down, up or down, depending on how you're going to play this passage, okay? Uh, so, again over three strings, and then you could do, for this color of the, of the F sharp, which is really flat now, uh, which brings me to another <coughs> between brackets. Um, when you tune the bass, the F sharp should always be a tad lower than equal tuning. Uh, when you tune it really right with the machine, it's going to sound awful. The major third is going to be really <coughs> awful. Uh, so you have to kind of compromise. The F sharp should be a bit flat, it's a bit too flat now. But the consequence of tuning your F sharp flattish is that all your notes in the fretted region on this string will be flat as well. So you have to see how much you can compromise, uh, find something in between so that the major third is tolerable and that the intonation here is more or less acceptable. Uh, there's, no, there's no rule about how flat you can you can tune your F sharp depends on which key you're playing. If you change keys, if it's in D major, most triads, all the triads on these three strings are going to sound really beautiful. If you have uh, another, another uh, tonality, maybe you, you should go more towards an equal tuning, okay? So that's about the F sharp. So when we come this. <laughs> You could use this one, which sounds beautiful, but it's a, maybe a bit weak. But maybe try to give a bit of this color to this one. Mm. Everything in one position. Also, economy of movement is important. Uh, you could do this. I see many bass players use this kind of fingerings. With a lot of air ballet in the left hand. And you don't need it, just... Uh, move as little as possible. It's a kind of challenge. Uh, for me as well, still now, I always try to find the challenge, how much lazier can I be? It's a question of being lazy is hard work. So I like to be lazy in the left hand and move as little as possible. Different possibilities, you can play the C sharp here instead of here. You see for yourself what sounds best, what is most comfortable. Uh, so let's do it again.
This is one of those where you can choose again. Uh, or this one is nice, but it, it, it kind of comes up from the deep end, from the dark, murky end to the brightness. Yeah, these different colors. See, here you stay in the same color. It's possible as well. Both, both are possible. It's an aesthetic choice rather than a technical one. Both are easy. Again, depending on, on the mood, it depends on so many things. Not only how do I feel today, but also how does the audience react. Uh, connection with the audience is very important. We are musicians because we have people who are going to listen to us. So this uh, interaction with an audience is very important in my musical choices as well, in what I'm going to do tonight. Depends. If I feel I'm losing the concentration of the audience, maybe I'll do something extra. I'll try to find a balance with, between what I'm doing, what, how, they, how the audience reacts to me. So it's not just about what's written on the page and what's historically correct or uh, guesswork and reading and reading the treatises and Quantz and Leopold Mozart, etc. But it's also about now, the moment of now, what's going on. Now you're on stage and now you have the audience in front of you and you have to entertain them or you have to move them in some way. So this is a very important aspect for me. And this is all connected. So my way of playing or my way of uh, looking at the music or of interpreting the music is always ultimately connected with who am I going to play for? Who is going to listen to me? And what am I going to do tonight? How is the audience reacting? And this will very probably influence my way of playing and my technical and musical solutions. So it's not just about the manuscript or the edition or the bowings and the fingerings. It's also this. This is a very important part. So um, <coughs> we had this choice. So this can be a very boring passage. Uh, we come from. And then maybe we can bring this change out. And we go back to the tutti part. Uh, so, as you see, you can, you can f make it more musical than it looks on the paper. It doesn't say crescendo, it doesn't say anything. It's up to the musician to bring out the music, right? And there are different ways you can do that. You can highlight the changing notes, or you can highlight the notes that say the same. You could do this. <laughs> See? And you can do the opposite. Um, sorry if it doesn't sound really beautiful and nice. This is one of those passages which maybe shouldn't sound too beautiful and too nice. Uh, it's one of the other aspects of uh, playing on, uh, on an old instrument and gut strings and playing this kind of music is that it frees you from preconceived ideas about uh, sound beauty and, uh, you know, in the modern bass we always kind of have the feeling we try to imitate the cello or imitate the violin and imitate the singing voice. We're not cellists. If we want to sound like a cello, maybe you should play the cello. Um, so I don't think it's really, for me at least, it's not really important. So sometimes you can go for something rough, something which in itself might sound ugly, let's say, but in the context maybe works better than something very beautiful, right? So then we come to the next tutti part, which is forte, it says forte, tutti forte. And then after that we have the theme again, but with a little bit of... <coughs> So instead of instead of doing this or this, now we have it's the last time it comes and we have something extra there. So here again, 
uh, the first time I did this, and the second time I did this, and the fourth time I'm doing something different again. Uh, I'm doing a, actually a very <laughs> normal way of playing. See? Normal bowing. And maybe instead of using the harmonic here, because we're nearing the end of the concerto and it's the last time we, we mentioned this theme. So for the last time, maybe I'll... let's see. Maybe I'll play it here. A bit more strong, a bit more reassured, a bit more positive, right? So play around with these possibilities. So you can play it on the on the first string maybe, see what works for you. And let's go on. Again, to make a difference with the first time, you can stay on one string now. For instance, so every time something comes back, and this is one of those things that we modern musicians do a lot, we see something coming back, the same theme or the same material, and when we see a different way or a different articulation, we think it's a mistake. The composer is wrong, and we e equalize everything and everything should be the same. If it comes back 20 pages later, we do it the same as the first time. And uh, we can see, first of all, there's no rule that it should be like that, and composers usually were well aware of uh, doing different things for different, uh, different needs. But especially in this concerto, <coughs> when material comes back, it's basically never the same thing as the first time. And you will see that in the first movement, in the second and the third movement. When something comes back, or something similar comes back, it's not the same. It's articulated differently. And it's articulated differently for a reason. I think for an emotional reason. You will, we will see that in the second and the third movement especially. Um, that is a hatent, a hatent, how do you say that in English? <laughs> uh, a hatent emotion every time something comes back. There's more emotion, there's more of some, there's a different, a different expression. So we shouldn't endeavor to play the same thing when it comes back. So here would be one of those occasions. Already he makes a difference here. It's already different. It's also, I think, the first time where he puts slashes on the note. Again, I could go on for two hours about those dots and slashes. I'm not going to do that. But let's make a difference. Let's maybe play it on one string for a different effect. Or maybe not. Then comes uh, another octave which is indicated and which, for my taste, is really... I find it quite awf awful, really. Uh, it goes like this. But what's written with the octave is... See what I mean? This is this kind of... This is the kind of... Uh, it leads to a kind of hysterical color if you don't pay attention, with lots of vibrato and uh, this kind of uh, bad imitation of, uh, of some other instrument. And I think, at least for me, it's personal. I'm not going to send the police if you play it like this, of course. But... Uh, <laughs> see? I think it's more colorful, it's more beautiful, it's more Im intimate, it's more, actually it's more romantic. We have it, maybe we think if we play high on the bass, it sounds more romantic, but actually in this case I think it's the opposite. Again, we have a choice how to play these notes. I like this. You have this beautiful, this beautiful chord. And you can like I did before, maybe you, you heard I, I do something different every time. I just give a little bit more emotion every time the figure comes back. A 
especially like this one. It's called a flat mom. The gamba players do that a lot. And it's, a, it's a kind of micro trill. I just love it. I will put them everywhere, especially on the E. Uh, every time I play an E, uh, kind of, I want to put the flat mom there. See? So, again, a, a chance to add some expression to, to the music. We're nearing the end is some something tender and emotional and not too hysterical here. <laughs> I'm not really, even if you do it without the vibrato, I don't think the register is really the most, maybe it's not the right moment to do that. Okay, so we have this passage uh, and then the tricky part. You wonder how they played it, right? How Sperger, whoever, how they played this. Maybe, or, or would they have done it across two strings? That's really, that's really difficult. It's a fantastic exercise, but I'm not sure it works very well. So we have a, a few options. Or on the second string. Which I don't really like so much on the second string. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit too dark in color for the passage. Uh, the fingering I use goes back a long way from the first time I played the concerto in modern tuning, and uh, I was about forty-five years younger than I am now. Oh my God! And I'll do this. I just slide back with the first string. See what works for you. Most people use the thumb. Something like that on the second string. See what works. Maybe try it across two strings. See how far you get with that. Good luck. Uh, so let's see. Then. <laughs> A bit added resonance. And this is a Dittersdorf fingering. I call this a Dittersdorf. Because in a Dittersdorf you have this. So this is the same type of fingering. And then I take over, and I go to the first string. So I go to the first string instead of staying here, but you could. As you can see, the intonation is a bit trickier here. In general, gut strings are a bit trickier. For intonation, of course, that's always a good excuse when you play out of tune, it's, it's the gut strings. And I'm sorry, I can't help it. But uh, again, same choice. I wouldn't do it on the third string because it's, a, it's an ending and if you end it a bit too softly, you miss the effect of... Uh, but everything's possible. And then again... <laughs> You can choose up or down. I like the feeling of of the down on the second beat. And you see, uh, I just told you that when material comes back, Van Hal always makes a difference. Sometimes a big difference, sometimes a small in a difference. The first time we had this. Uh, But here it goes to the third strings. See, that's the difference here. Uh, articulations are different, so it's a bit more tricky technically. I'll explain. So the beginning is not that complicated. can 
go back to the oh play it there when I play it here I slide this one back I go from I slide this finger back and then I'm ready for the next bit see and this is a position that I use very often in Viennese tuning and maybe if you learn one thing today maybe that's uh, that the thing you should remember is to use the third finger where you normally you would use the, the first finger or maybe the second one actually in mo on modern bass we never use the third finger here on what is on a modern bass the A and in Viennese tuning the B you would never use the third finger but I use it all the time because very often you have this figure and this is much easier to switch from 2 and 1 to 1 and 3 and actually if you bear with me for a second for the people who play guitar or ukulele this is just the shape of a 7th chord it's a different uh, it's tuned differently but that's the figure D7 so this D7 here it's not D7 because ukulele but the 7th shape is the shape that I use in Viennese tuning very very often so third finger see and so that's what I do here too third second see now this looks like a great fingering and it is a great fingering for, it's, it's very Viennese on the other hand if it's really fast it's, it's kind of clumsy in the bow it's very difficult to make it clear so for once I would stay on one string actually if you really want it clear if you want a clear sound much clearer see mm -hmm. one three three one four one I think in w in the excitement of the concerto when you play a little bit faster and you want it to be clear it's better on the on the first string and then comes the same kind of figure we saw before uh, which is this one and this time it's really clear because uh, the article is so clear three notes slurred one note with a slash to set it apart so there's no doubt about it um, uh, something interesting about the fingering when you play it on a modern bass you'd probably do this this kind of fingering in Viennese tuning you don't have to do that they lie next to each other see uh, and then the alternating figure is this one and uh, this brings me to an, another important element in Baroque and classical music that is that um, there's not only like I said gesture in the music there's always sort of gesture there uh, there's speech and both combined actually the basis of this whole thing is theater is dialogue and you can see this for instance in a passage like this one but in in most of the music of those periods you find this idea of dialogue one guy says this and the other guy says that and the third one gives a conclusion there's something going on like someone comes on stage left and then the one, other one comes from the right side and it's a kind of dialogue and you can do that here as well see you have this alternation so one person says something or begging maybe and the other guy says no way never 
something. You can imagine something, you can imagine some scenario, but these things are always in the music. You just have to find them. And um, don't be afraid to play it rough. On an ancient instrument, you're allowed to do that. Just let it scream a bit. Uh, also, technically, because of the setup of the Viennese bass, the Viennese bass has a very flat bridge. Uh, and it's almost inevitable that you will touch more than one string, even if you try. Otherwise, you have to play so carefully that there's no musical content left. So, if you dig in, if you really play, you're going to touch more than one string. And usually, in the solo pieces, that's intended, or at least it's allowed. Uh, in ensemble music, it can be a, a problem that you have notes that don't fit in the chord, but these pieces are so well written that... Who cares? It's one chord, so... So you don't have to be careful to make every note nice and separate and beautiful. It's not necessary. So you can play along with the drama. And we come to that. So um, I go down over three strings in this uh, scale passage. See? Just kind of skip down. And you can really jump with the bow and make it really dramatically strong. Um, maybe... I stay on the third string, I don't go down, because afterwards I have this D. And it's easy because I have the F sharp here, F sharp D. If I have the F sharp here, uh, sorry, I have to make this big skip. So I go down over three strings. See, it's easier to stay in one position. Uh, then we come to the next little bit. And And then again the trick with the third finger. And then the fourth finger in thumb position, which we never do in uh, modern bass technique. Well, maybe some people do that, but generally we don't use the fourth finger. So we use the three fingers across the three strings, second, third and fourth. Um, of course, you don't have to do that. You can, you can as well. Uh, but then you have this awkward skip on one string. So it's it's better, I think, to do it across the strings. Okay, and then we have the last little bit. In. See what I do? I use the first finger as a barrier across three strings. We do that very often in, uh, in Viennese tuning. You don't have to lift the finger and, and move it across the strings. A lot of people play like this. Like they're playing piano or trumpet, but it's not necessary. See? And you can use a different fingering instead of going across the strings. You can also do this. Kind of two times the same thing, more or less, with an extension. And then for the last one, or here. You can choose one str on the first string or the second string. So uh, those are a few of the possibilities in Viennese tuning. 
and then we go back to the to the lower string uh, to the third string that's easy it's harmonic but what are we going to do after that this or or you can stay in thumb position instead of going down on the second string. Mm -hmm. So we come to the end of the first movement. I hope I gave you some ideas, some inspiration, something to think about, something to disagree with, because that's important as well. Let's, let's have a dialogue. I, like to, I would like to hear your ideas about uh, what you think about Van Halen Viennese tuning, what solutions you found. Maybe you found different things uh, technically and musically. Um, a last thing, um, there's a cadenza, probably by Sperger. Um, in general, Sperger was quite a good composer, uh, not only in his bass music and his chamber music, uh, there's also uh, other music, oratorio and, and this kind of thing, and uh, some of it is really absolutely splendid. But the cadenzas that we have here, I don't find them fantastic, uh, and I always uh, take the advice from uh, Quantz, from Joachim Quantz, when he talks about cadenzas um, in the chapter about wind instruments, not string instruments, because uh, as bass players uh, and as musicians in general, let's also look uh, over the fence, let's see what's written about other instruments. And when you read uh, the treatise of Quantz, don't just read the little part about the bass or the little part about the string instruments, but read the whole book and you will find inspiration there as well. And the reason I mention this is that Quanz uh, suggests for a cadenza for a wind instrument that it should be so short that you can play it in one breath. And I think that's pretty good advice for us uh, string players as well. Because very often uh, it can happen that you play a very beautiful movement and sometimes you kind of destroy it with a cadenza that's too long, that's not interesting, that kind of loses the concentration of the audience. So I think it's better to have a very short, sweet cadenza. Write it yourself, make your own cadenza. Don't, don't take a cadenza th from one of those editions. Just see what you can come up with yourself. Make it short and sweet and then move on to the next movement and keep the attention, keep the concentration, not only of the audience but of yourself as well. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this first video. I'm not used to shooting videos, this is my first one, so bear with me, the next one will be even worse. <laughs> no, I hope it's going to be better. But uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I would also like to mention that uh, very soon my book will be published. It's called Meta Hodos, and it's about the Viennese bass and the part that's a method for the Viennese bass as a solo instrument, not as an ensemble instrument, but just this kind of work actually as a solo instrument uh, is going to be available soon and uh, we will let you know. There's going to be a website as well, viennesetuning.com, uh, but we'll mention that in the next videos so you can easily find that. Uh, I'm looking forward to your comments, uh, positive or negative, keep it polite, keep it nice. Uh, and uh, keep it civilized and uh, I'm very curious to hear what you think and uh, your ideas about this beautiful instrument. Thank you, see you next time, bye. <laughs>